Hey everybody, welcome to the Visual Lounge. My name is Matt Pierce. I'm going to be your host today and it's going to be me today and we're not going to have a guest, but that's okay because we're going to be talking about some data that TechSmith has been collecting for really almost, a, I guess we're getting close on a decade now, 2013, 2016, and again at the end of 2018, looking at why people start and stop watching videos, but really uh, it's a, we call it the value or we call it the video viewer study. And it's really looking at preferences and ideas, but we're going to dive into that in just a minute because, you know, before we get going here, just, I, I want to make sure that you guys are aware of a great resource that is out there and available for you. The TechSmith Academy, of course, go learn about making video, go learn about screen recording, script writing, storyboarding, about creating job aids. And we've got more stuff coming soon to really enhance what you guys are doing out there to create better training content with visuals and video and or documentation or sales content or marketing or whatever it is that you do. So uh, always happy to pitch the TechSmith Academy because it's, you know, it's a dear project for us and we, we love that we can give away that, that information. Okay, so I've got some slides. We're going to be looking at these slides where, let's see where they are over here. We're going to be looking at some slides because I've got some data that I want to call out. Now, all this data is available on TechSmith's website. I want to let you know that you can go find this data. You can find, we've got blog posts about it. We've got the research reports that you can download. Dana, but we're to the gonna, visual what I'm going to try to do is contextualize it because sometimes I look at data and I say, this is great data, but what does it mean for me? What does it mean for me about creating videos? And we're going to focus on these two points. How do you help people start watching your content and how do you keep them from stopping? And I want to be clear, there's no magic bullet here. There's not a formula. Uh, that's going to be something that you can just automatically be like, if I always do this, it's always going to work, but you got to be testing your audience, testing with your audience, working with them and making sure you're trying to do the right things. So let's move ahead here. So a couple things I mentioned the research report, you can download it. If here's a QR code, I'm going to just keep moving them. Okay. A little background on this study. I mentioned that we've done this in 2013, 2016, and, and again, at the end of 2018. And in this latest iteration of the study at the end of 2018, we had almost a thousand participants and a couple things that you should know is that they were not just U S centric. Uh, there was U S Canada, France, Germany, the UK and Australia. So still very much an English, somewhat English centric, um, kind of span, obviously not completely global, but hopefully it gives us a broader picture that these things are applying, not just to a U.S. audience, but to a more of a global audience. And they were asked to do something or they're asked to tell us about a video that they watched that was either instructional or informational in the past three months for uh, work related purposes. So we're not going to get into the entertainment videos. We're not going to get into videos that are just for the pure joy of watching videos. But what we're talking about is videos that were purposeful for their work and it had to be instructional. Like maybe it's a how to video or step by step or informational where it's delivering a message. And there's lots of type, different types of informational videos. A couple other things you should know, it was a variety of industries. So we weren't just talking to students. We were talking to people that were employed or self-employed or part-time. So two huge problems, right? We're all, we're all facing this when we're creating as video creators, whether you're doing that as an instructional designer, as a marketer, a uh, technical writer, whatever your field of work is. There's two problems. You got to get people to start watching your video because if they don't start it, the problem is you, you, they're never going to get the information that they need and you got to keep them from watching. So keep them from stopping watching. And there's a lot of reasons people are going to want to stop watching video and it might not be anything that you're doing. It might be circumstantial, but understanding some of these things can really help us create, I think, more informative, more instructional or better instructional videos that will be more impactful on our audience. Key thing here is remember, it is your audience that you're thinking about. They are the ones that matter. All right, so we need viewers to start watching, like I just said, and again, we need them to keep watching. So what are we gonna do? What are the challenges that we're gonna do here? Um, so the first thing we have to do is understand some of the elements, like what's going to go into the stages of like, where are they looking for this? What are they doing? And then once they get watching, what are the things that they're looking for? Generally speaking, we're going to really look through this kind of through a process here. Hopefully that will be, you guys will find helpful. 
Uh, but before we do that, I want to kind of lay out a perspective here. Instead of saying just, hey, Matt, this is what I'm just going to tell you about the data. I want to look at this more kind of almost like a case study. So we're going to look at a persona and the persona here, let's just lay this out. This is a totally fictional person that I made up based on things that I know. Uh, so this is Jenna. Let me actually here make this a little easier for you guys to see. So this is Jenna. Uh, she's a training specialist at a financial organization. And like a lot of training specialists, she has jobs. She has certain things that she's going to be doing, scheduling classes, occasionally helping with facilitating courses. And of course, she's got skills and strengths, just like all of your viewers do. Uh, and they, you know, she's pretty good with technology. She's not good with PowerPoint, which is going to set up our pref our, our kind of scenario today. She works in the LMS. Uh, she's okay with design, but not really good. Not a strong point, but she's a really good writer. Uh, she's good at social media and she kicks butt at Mario Kart because why not? And so as we're setting up the scenario and we're looking at Jenna, uh, she's going to have a problem. And the problem that she has is let's say she wants to learn how to remove the background of an image in PowerPoint. Now, of course she could do that in a million other tools, but for our scenario, it's gonna help set this up. So, you know, she's typically watching two or more videos a week that are instructional, informational. She watches during those times, she's got some attributes, you know, she doesn't like asking for help, which is why she might be turning to video. Uh, you know, these are just some personal things about her that maybe make her a little bit more real for you and me. So let's get into our first piece of data. Keep Jenna in mind though. How frequently do viewers watch instructional or informational videos? So when we looked at people who were watching videos during the study, like they're saying to us that they on average are watching two to five videos that are instructional or informational a week. By far the most, right? We see some people watching more and there's obviously people that are watching less. Uh, but I, I, I think it's important to realize that we're going to see something here that is, I think, even maybe more important is, is that not so much how much are people watching right now, but the trend over time that we see in 2013, only 21% of the people were watching two or more videos a week. And now it's 53% of the people are watching two or more videos a week. And why is that important? That is important because people are getting more and more information for video. They're seeking out more video, I think. It's also probably a trend that more information is being delivered in video. So as we're thinking about this, we one have to understand that your audience, if it's internal to your organization, is probably starting to expect to receive video more and more. And so we can just use that, keep that in the back of our heads that like, okay, so people are starting to watch more video. So it's not like it's a forbidden medium or one that people aren't using. They're actually using it quite a bit. And I think we're going to see, and hopefully we'll do this study again here in the next year or two, but I think we'll see that continues to grow. All right. So next, next stat here, when are people watching? And to me, the most interesting thing about this is that it's all over the board. It's not that it's uh, necessarily, there's one that kind of wins out. That's, you know, just the best. We see that, you know, sure. A lot of people are watching in the evening, but why is that? Well, that's probably because a lot of us are doing things like home improvement. We're learning how to bake. We're doing all these other things that are happening. And as we do that, you know, we're going to be turning to video. So just keep in mind that there's no one time that people are watching. I mean, a lot of us don't watch at night, or, you know, past midnight. Uh, we're not watching a lot in the morning. We're probably waiting until we get some coffee in us or some caffeine or whatever your choice, uh, drink of choice is uh, to, to get going. But uh, it's, uh, you know, one of the things we just want to be aware of it. So. Okay, we got them some view, viewing behaviors. We know when people are kind of coming in and looking at things. And we go ahead here. Let's look at the next thing. So let's talk about Jenna's problem. I mentioned this really briefly before, but I want to mention it again. What's our persona Jenna is going to be able to, wants to be able to remove an image from the background, or uh, the background image of in PowerPoint. So she's got a, a photo she wants and she wants to take out the background. Maybe it's a cutout, a person, kind of like something like her picture here. And that's not easy to do. So she's got to go figure out how she's going to learn how to do that. All right. So what, what does Jenna do? Well, there's probably a lot of options that she could take here. So what does she do? Well, you know, maybe she works at a big organization and she can go search SharePoint, right? She can go look on SharePoint 
for that information. And it maybe isn't the best place to look. Maybe that information doesn't exist, but she's probably going to look start someplace, right? So if not SharePoint, maybe she goes talk to a coworker. One of the things I want to point out about Jenna and the coworkers, though, is that with coworkers, we said she's fiercely kind of independent, doesn't like to ask for help. So maybe she isn't going to ask her coworker. That's an option. A lot of us would probably just go search Google for it, right? This is what we do. We would go to Google. We type in, how do I remove a background image from power in PowerPoint? And, uh, and then, you know, some of us, we might even say, send us if we could go, let, let me Google that for you. I don't know if you guys have seen this site before, but here we go. <laughs> you know, you can send this to somebody just kind of, I'm being a little facetious here. But we know that Google is a hugely popular place to go and find answers. It's the world's largest search engine. And of course, people are going to be searching for answers there. But she has other options, right? She could go to the second largest search engine, which is YouTube. I like to call it the first largest search engine or the sorry, the first largest how to engine because there's so much great content. I just had a stat that I was looking at and I shared in a presentation yesterday that over 500 hours, uh, I think it was 500 hours of content is uploaded to YouTube every minute. And a lot of that is going to be how-to content. Now, I get inside of your organization, you may not want to have content, you know, coming from these outside sources that's unverified, unregulated, and uncontrolled. But just know that your learners are starting to get used to going to YouTube to learn how to do something. They want to fix their, their kitchen sink that's leaking. They want to do another kind of repair or learn how to gain a skill. They're going there where we're probably expecting them to go to our LMS and find a course that they can take. And neither of those paths are wrong, but you have to understand, I think more and more we're going to see people just diving into wanting to use video as a method for learning. And it's never going to replace everything. I think face-to-face -face has a place. I think that, uh, you know, online interactive things like the, you might build in Storyline or Captivate or whatever tool you're using, those are awesome and have a place. But video, I think, is going to continue to grow. Okay, and more data here. This one is about starting to get into the mindset of how is someone like Jenna looking or how are we looking for content? Uh, in this study, most people said that they search for it. We see the Google. We also see that someone shared it with me or they were required to watch it. Uh, someone posted it to me directly, but, but not to me. So they saw it, you know, whether it's on Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook, something like that. Yeah, they just stumble upon it. Um, some people just can't remember. So people are finding videos in a variety of ways. And I think this is important to know. If people are searching out, if half of people are searching out information, we need to make sure that when we are going to be out in a public space or even inside of our organization that people can find us. They can find our content. So if let's say you're internally to a corporate like LMS system or SharePoint and you have, you don't want people using YouTube, fine, but make sure that they can find the information that you are sharing and that you are creating so that they know they, that this is the definitive. There's nothing more frustrating to someone who's trying to figure something out than not being able to find the answer um, I, I've gone through this process many times and I can tell you that sometimes it's just drives you crazy and you, you want to just give up and not worry about learning the thing. So now let's make some choices for Jenna. We've got our persona that we looked at. Jenna's got some choices here to make, you know, she could just do a search for, you know, how to remove backgrounds from images in PowerPoint. And this is what you'd probably get. There's a lot to look through and you probably look at the top three to five and never go to page two. There's nothing wrong with that. And if you can, if you're going to go for an SEO or search engine, engine optimization play, that's fine. Uh, but it can be tough to get on that first page. It's really tough to make your content stand out that much, but it can be done. Well, we could also go to YouTube and look at what happens when we go to YouTube. And I just did a, a capture of a scrolling. I just kept scrolling. And as I was going through this and you can see there's a lot there and this would have keep, kept going. There is a ton of competition on YouTube. And so if you're trying to get found on YouTube, you have to know uh, that, you know, these are these, there's so much that you need to do when you're in YouTube, you got to stand out. Now let's look at a few things that are going to help you to be able to stand out. So I took a few of these different 
uh, YouTube videos and I just grabbed a screenshot, put them together because I want to look at the variety and I want you to look at this. And as we're looking at this, what I think I, I'm, I'm curious about is which one would you choose? You know, Jenna a little bit, you know that her problem is she's trying to remove a background image from a photo in PowerPoint. So how do you decide what to watch? Is it one, two, three, four, five? Which one of these would you choose? To, to watch first, or maybe only one that you choose to watch. I'm curious what you guys have to say. Okay, and so why? Well, your viewer, whether you're thinking about it really consciously or not, you're making decisions based on a lot of things. And there's a couple of things that we found in our study that I think really make a difference. Now, we're really trying to get people to watch, right? And so the things that uh, uh, getting them to watch is, you know, at best is, it's going to be tough. So here's some of the things that people said in the study about why they watch the videos that they said they did. Number one, title and description were interesting or intriguing. So there's something about that title that plays a really important role because it's telling you, it's like, hey, yes, this is going to help me. This is the information I need. Number two, the video length was acceptable. Now notice it didn't say it was the shortest. It said it was acceptable. Now, it's hard for us to define what acceptable is. There's so many circumstances or situations where, you know, you might want something that's like a minute long or you might want something that's 15 minutes long, depending on what you're trying to do, the complexity and how deep you're trying to go and learn. So the next thing is the video looked entertaining. Maybe that's important to your audience. Maybe it's not. It had a lot of views. So maybe there's social proof there that as people look at the video and they're like, oh, well, this has like, a hundred thousand views on it. It must be good. Whether that's true or not is we could debate and you'd want to, you know, kind of look at it, but if it's getting that many views, why, you know, so that's another kind of piece of this. I'd seen uh, content from the same author or company before. So it becomes a trusted source. That's great. You want to, especially inside of an organization, you want to be a trusted source. You want people to be like, Oh, Hey, we know that Jesse made that video. So it's going to be good. I want to watch it. Um, uh, next one down here is kind of similar to, in, in at least the numbers, the thumbnail was compelling. A good thumbnail can go a long way. You notice like if you looked at uh, thumbnails that TechSmith is using, we are trying to put more and more human faces in it because it it has value. It draws people in. They they feel that connection. They'd heard about it. They can't remember or they were bored. Not kind of rounds out the bottom there. Not, not too much there. So you want to be thinking about this. So we need a good title. We don't want, we want an acceptable length. We want it to look engaged. I'm going to, I want to change the word entertaining. That's the word that they use in the study. I would focus more on engaging um, and then get some social proof before going for it. Okay. So there's been a lot of data that's thrown out here. And what I want to say at this point is this is a quote from Albus Dumbledore from Harry Potter. If you're not a fan, that's okay. It's from this point forth, we shall be leaving the firm foundation of fact and journey, journeying together through the murky marshes of estimation into the thickets of wild guesswork. Because as we move forward through the rest of it, I can only speculate about what is going to work for you. Without knowing your audience, without knowing your content, without knowing your circumstances and situation, there's only so much I can guess at. And I'm happy to talk about those things and work with you on those things. However, there's only so much we can do without being like, I don't know. It depends. And I, it's, I know it feels like a cop out on sometimes on those answers, but that's the way it really is. So I just want to be clear as, here as we look forward. Okay. So as we go back to our looking at these, we can see the title. Now there's a couple of things here that I think are interesting. Um, I know, uh, I think it was, uh, someone said two, right? Uh, they said, so no, the second one, PowerPoint 2013 background removal. One of the things I like about that one and actually three and four is they give a year of, for the product. If you're using two, PowerPoint 2013, you know that's for you. If you're not using 2013, hallelujah, you know it's not for you. Like I know I'm on, I think I'm on 2019 or whatever the current Office 365 version is. So I could totally skip that one. They've done me a favor and that's not a bad thing that they cut me out as an audience. They don't need me as an audience. I'm not going to do them any favors to their view time, their watch rate, or I'm not even going to pay attention to it if I click on that one because it's not the right video for me. But, you know, I also really like uh, number four because it's like, hey, it's for all of these. And then it's like, 
Remove it uses that key phrase, how to remove a background in PowerPoint, how to make a background transparent. So I like number four. Um, I think number one is, is kind of weak though. Like PowerPoint remove picture background. It's got the right words effects series. Well, that, that means nothing to me. So be thinking about your title. You want it to be descriptive, helpful, and allow the user to know what they're going to get. And that expectation we're going to see in an, another stat here pretty soon is really, really important. The expectation is really important. And we'll get to that in a second. So I just took these video descriptions, pulled them out. Um, you only get so many lines in a video description typically. And again, you can see here, they're doing some of the same things with like the, the, the PowerPoint version. Um, you know, like if you look at this middle one here in this video, you'll learn more about removing the background in PowerPoint. Uh, it's a, it, it is saying basically the same thing as the title. Um, you know, so you want to look through these and you're going to want to write things again, set the expectation. Uh, you know, people are going to maybe read the description, maybe not. So just be aware that it's, it is important though. Okay. Length of video. We get asked at TechSmith all the time, what is the best length of a video? And we can see here that, you know, they, the video, we got 10 minutes to one minute. And like I said before, you might want to favor the one minute because it gets you done, but does it have enough information? Is it going to really help me? Or is it just going to blow through some high level stuff, skip a few steps, assuming that I know things and I don't know. And, and it's hard to judge just from a time. So let's actually, let's move ahead and look at this. Okay. So this is from the study and, uh, this was preferred length of video. So people said to us, I prefer this length of video. And you can see interestingly enough that the highest ranked ones are three to four minutes and five to six minutes. Does that mean I think every video needs to be three to four or three to six minutes? No, I think you can be very successful with a 30 second video. If that's all it needs, can you be successful with a 10 to 20 minute video? Yes, you can. Some people preferred that. Uh, in our conversation with Andy Crestedina a couple weeks ago, one of the things that he mentioned is he's, that he's making a lot of 12 minute long videos. And the, and I asked him, why are you making that long of videos? I don't know if it was, those were the exact words, but the thing he talked about was that it's easy to make the short videos. It's easy to just kind of pump out something and say like, Oh, here you go. Really high level surface. And that might be what your audience needs, but he's looking to dig deeper and give more information. And so I think it's okay you have permission to make longer videos. Now you might have to argue with your stakeholders. You have to really think about, does it need to be that long? Is that really gotta be that much information? Um, and, and really make the decisions based on that, not just an arbitrary length. So I would uh, definitely think about what content you need. So make it as short as possible and as long as needed and good editors in film and video, learn to cut out as much as they can, but leaving the core necessary critical information, but don't, don't focus on two or three different points. Focus on one, just one point. Um, and then, you know, if you need another video, make another video. So, but we have some flexibility and leeway to, I think, to make longer videos. I think it's becoming more expected, more acceptable. Um, you know, I used to be, I, if you would have asked me a couple of years ago and I'm like, Hey Matt, go on, YouTube and Facebook and LinkedIn. Tell us how long it should be. Like two minutes. Got to make two minute videos or no more than three. And I've changed my mind. I think there's lots of room here for a little bit longer form. Again, if the content is focused and it's going to be short as possible, but long as necessary. Okay. Thumbnails. Now thumbnails didn't rank real high on that preference. It wasn't at the super at top. It's kind of in the middle, but I think it's important. And I think we've got some good options here. Uh, when we look at thumbnails, I really like the ones that are, are speaking to me. I think number three does a great job, shows you exactly what you're looking for. And it, you know, so just like this, oh yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I think number two, it has a strong brand appeal. Like I know it's about PowerPoint, but I've got to read it and I may be skimming fast because we saw that long, long, long list of PowerPoint. And I might just skip past it because it, it, it doesn't look like anything that I might want to, to do. Um, uh, so, you know, number, I think number four is pretty good. I think, uh, I feel like number five kind of misses the mark just a little bit. And I'm look, I'm not a thumbnail expert here, but be thinking about what's going to draw your audience in, right? 
what information can you convey in that quick glance? It's that's what it's about. It's a quick glance. I can see it. I'm gonna look at the title, look at the thumbnail. I might not ever read the description, and boom, I'm in. Um, and so just be be thoughtful about that. And even if you're in an LMS or you're putting a video inside of a course, like entice your viewer. If you want them to start watching your viewer, you gotta work at it a little bit. And I know for a lot of people that are not that are not marketers, that feels like why? Why do I have to do that? They they're compelled. I'm making them take this course doesn't matter. You want them to have that initial like, oh yeah, this is for me or, oh, I'm, this is going to be okay because you know, why set them up with this like a black screen with the play button on it? Give them a little bit more so that they are enticed to watch it. Okay. So shifting gears a little bit, we've talked a lot about kind of that start, what people are looking for. Why do people stop watching your videos? How long should a live video live before making adjustments? I wish I had a good answer for that. Um, there's a, I've got my class. This is my classic TechSmith. I made a huge mistake story. Uh, we created a video and maybe some of you have saw it. I don't, I don't know if you can find it uh, publicly on YouTube anymore, but it was like a, a, a 50, we'll say 55 second video about green screen in Camtasia. We wanted to like help people to know you could use, remove a color in Camtasia. And so we decided to make this action thriller commercial and it was based on the TV show 24 roughly. And like, there's a running shot. The guy opens up a briefcase and there's like, dry, we had dry ice and steam comes out. And it was super fun to make. It turned out really well. We were all really thrilled with it. We put it up. We actually were advertising on YouTube with it. Views were going crazy. And we looked at the data. And one of the things that we saw, when you look at the analytics, you could see where people fall off. And at 37 seconds, we saw this drop off. Now this is a 55 second long video. We had another, you know, I don't know what, 12, 15 seconds that we needed them to watch because at the very end was the tagline. That's when we told them this was Camtasia that they just saw that was so easy to remove a color. But at 37 seconds, something happened and we saw probably 50% or more of the viewers just drop. And what happened in that video was you had this idea, this guy was, he's was, he was like trying to give a presentation and he needed a file. So this guy's running it to him and removing the background and all this stuff. And then we had people applause. They, you know, yay, great presentation, yay. Which signaled the end to the viewer. We were devastated. We had failed. We'd put money on this and we had failed. And so, you know, we 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 didn't go reshoot the video. We did go in and add some things as like, hey, from you know, from Camtasia from TechSmith and stuff like that. It was never really that successful at that point because People still, you know, we signaled the end. Um, and so Jason, to your point, if you see, if you can get the date, like you're probably gonna have to watch a little bit to get enough data. It depends on how many views you acquire, uh, how quickly or uh, how fast you can get enough kind of a understanding that that's happening. Um, but you know, I think a lot of, of this is AB testing, trying, trying things out. If, if you think it's not working, you know, try making a change and seeing what happens. You can always put the video back to the way it was because you have that. Um, and so don't hesitate to do it. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's probably times when you want to, but you want to make sure you have enough data that you're really understanding what's going on, what needs to change. So that would be my advice. It's a great question. It's really hard. Uh, you and I can chat more about that afterwards if you want offline. But um, I think it's, it's, it's an important thing to know. It's know that you sometimes have to change things and watch, watch the data, see what's happening. Speaking of people stop watching, number one reason people stop watching is they were not getting the information they expected. Those expectations, that title, that description, that thumbnail, setting the expectations. But if they're like, oh, I thought this was about removing a background and it's really about making tables, they're going to stop watching it because it's not for them. Number two is, is a little bit, a little bit scary. It's I was bored and it wasn't interesting. That's, that's tough. Uh, so we need to be engaging enough to allow people to really, you know, get into it. And sometimes that's going to be hard. That's going to be topics. You're going to deal with topics that are, we'll call them more difficult topics. Um, so you need to be thinking about that. What can you do? I think we don't have to necessarily make the most creative, viral sensation video that's going to be funny because, you know, I'm not a comedian. You guys, you're, if you listen to me this whole time, you know I'm not that funny. But I think what we can do is help them to invest in the concept. If you, Compliance training is a great example of this. You know, you've probably had to do some kind of harassment training or you've done something like cyber training, those kind of things. 
what I'd recommend is help them understand why that's so important. What's the value to them? What's the value to the organization? Why are we compelling them to do this? And I think that can help make it a little bit more interesting. It still might be boring, but maybe you can do things to spice it up. Uh, number three, you can't do much about. They had something else to do. If you are inside an organization and they're watching this on your internal network, can you pave a way to make sure they have time? You know, can you make sure that you're giving them time and permission to step away from whatever their daily work is to do this? Uh, number four here, I think it goes really to the first one. It didn't cover the right topic. This is where it's maybe you're like, oh, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of something like Camtasia. Like we're going to talk about uh, using interactive hotspots and you don't ever really get to it or you talk about something just adjacent to it that's close or maybe didn't go deep enough. Uh, <laughs> number five, I got distracted. I can't help them. I, I don't know what we can do. The quality was poor. I don't want us to get hung up on that one. I think there is, uh, you, you can't have poor quality. Other, very bottom of the barrel, it wasn't entertaining. A lot of times it's not our job to entertain. If you can, you can. If not, but I don't think that's really... We can't really do much about that one. Okay, so we talked a lot about these, right? If you look in the mirror and they're saying, this is not what I thought I'd see, we just need to, we need to really kind of hone in on that and, and understand it. Ask your viewers, did this meet the expectations? Talk to them, do surveys, do polls, figure out, make sure it's matching. Again, board not interesting, we get it. You know, people don't want to hear the same thing over and over. They don't want to be learning the same things 12 times because if they've learned it, they've learned it. So can you make it a little bit more interesting for them? Provide maybe a unique perspective. Hopefully looking at Jenna's perspective today provided a little bit of that. You know, they have something else to do, make that time for them. So if you were creating a training, a video about removing background in PowerPoint, how would you keep Jenna watching? I'm curious. Like, what are the things that you would do to help her? You know, for right now, I know I'm going to probably, you know, first I'm going to get her in there, start watching, and I'm going to try to make it interesting. Um, removing backgrounds kind of a, it's this kind of interesting subject. So be thinking about that. What would you do? What kind of things that you would want to see? For me, one of the things is you got to keep that fire burning. Help her to feel like she's progressing. Help like her to feel like she's going to be successful, that she's getting the information she needs so she can do the thing that she wants to do. Now, I don't actually ever remove backgrounds in PowerPoint because it's it's difficult to make it look good. Um, but I do think there are things that you can do in any video to help make sure you're building. Build, maybe build in a little bit of mystery. You know, maybe you're giving some interesting things that are going to be successful that they wouldn't have thought of. So just kind of keep keep them moving along. So what are some of the key elements? So um, reasons people were interested in watching it, uh, and I think these are important. I genuinely was interested in the topic. We can't always guarantee that, but if you can, you're going to find people that are, you know, make it interesting for them. Content was relatable. So think about your people that you're talking to. What's going to relate to them? If you're talking to lawyers, that might be very different than if you're talking to, to someone who's working on a construction site and they have to worry about health and safety. Or uh, let's take an extreme. Maybe you're talking to uh, nuclear scientists, right? Like you might have to find that there's different ways to relate to them. Uh, the speaker could be interesting. You know, there's professional style or video effects. So things that you see might draw them in a little bit. Uh, this next one at 24%, good music and audio. Let's Let's pause here for a second and say that good audio is critical. If I could give you advice on anything to upgrade, good audio. Um, but music can be challenging if you are teaching. If you're giving some advice, you're giving some, uh, you're talking to people about, uh, you know, a variety of things like, um, and you want this music background, but they're trying to learn. What happens is people can't process both the narration and the music at the same time. Uh, so you want to just be mindful, of, use music sparingly. Uh, if you're unique or humorous, that people were interested in that. I'm not that unique or humorous, but uh, I get the concept. Uh, I was required to watch it. Yep. And quizzes or surveys. So think about quizzes and surveys, not as just a testing methodology, but a way to say like, hey, take a break. In fact, Richard, Dr. Richard Mayer, in an, uh, an article that was published not too long ago, he's doing kind of a, a research literature review. And one of the things that he said is that having your learners summarize what they're learning throughout like the video watching process actually increases learning. 
And there's probably lots of ways to summary. They don't just have to be taking notes and maybe that has part of it. I'd have to look again at the article, but, but there's definitely something to say like, Hey, don't just turn this on in the background. What did you think? What are three things that you learned? You know, even if I said today to you all, what's your, what are your top three takeaways? That in theory will help your learners to learn more and take more away from it. It definitely helps with long-term retention and memory. So what are we going to build? We're going to be build content that we can relate to. This guy in his, you know, leisure suit and he's actually standing in a swimming pool. I don't relate to him, but your videos, you want to make it relatable. You want to make it something that people can focus on. We got the speaker. So I don't want anyone to feel like they can't do this because you can. It doesn't mean you have to be the world's best professional speaker. Uh, and I mean that what you have to be is someone that people can look to and feel comfortable with. They want to feel like they're talking with you or they want to feel like they're learning from an expert that actually cares about them. I think those are the types of things that are going to make a difference. Professional style. I'm not really sure what professional style means. I think there's lots of ways to be professional. I don't think we have to be perfect. We don't have to, you know, there's a lot of things that don't have to be super high quality that can be, can be successful. I did mention audio already, but again, I cannot stress it enough. Get, a, get yourself a microphone. Think about what types of videos you're going to make. Get a lapel, get a shotgun, get a, like a blue Yeti is kind of like the universal mic. If you can find one, I know there's uh, some short supply given the uh, world health issues that are going on. Um, but really invest in audio. And then if you're going to invest in more stuff, then invest in lights and then you can invest in a camera. And of course, you don't even need a camera. You can just use things like Camtasia as well. Okay, so changing gears again a little bit here. So in the study, we not only asked for people's thoughts and opinions, we asked them to send us videos that they thought were good examples of instructional or informational videos. We got 95 different videos that our team went through and they coded and looked at and said like, hey, what are the commonalities between these 95 videos? What things do good videos, as purported by our, our, our participants, what do good videos have in common or what are the common traits? And here's what we see. Number one, they had clear voiceover, clear audio that was easy to understand. We just, absolutely. The next one had camera video. So they're showing, if they were showing any real world content, I think a lot of them had that. I don't think it's necessary because you can do great videos with screen content as well. Number three, and this is interesting, it had hyperlinks or a call to action, which we would refer to as a CTA. Basically, they gave them a next step. Good, a lot, 64% of these videos gave a next step. You might not have a next step, but maybe it's a sign that's, you know, make sure you check it off that you've done it. Maybe it's go learn here. Maybe it's another resource, you know, here's a link, whatever. And so you want to be thinking about like, hey, what's next for this person? And that was a, that was a commonality. A lot of them had title clips and intros. They had text overlays. They had transition effects. 49% uh, of them had visible speaker in the video. There's some research out there. Uh, I won't get into the details, but you know, use it your use with discretion. You don't always have to be in the video. I I'm doing it here because I want to connect with you. Hopefully, that's my reason. Uh, a lot of them had background music. They had an out clip. A lot of them did screen recording, uh, call outs, graphics, PowerPoint slides, and so forth. So. The thing that I love about this is it's like, oh, well, these are things that are common. The thing that I don't like about this and why I sometimes am he hesitant to give this data because I don't want you to think if you do all these things, you've made a great video. If you selectively choose the things that are going to help your audience and make sense for your video, that's when you'll be successful. And so don't just go through this as a checklist. It is not, I need to do all these things. Pick a few of them and do them well and you'll have better results. So we talked a lot about these real world video contexts. Again, I want to emphasize you don't have to have real world video content. If you do, uh, you know, your smartphone, it can be good enough, right? Like it doesn't have to be this perfect, perfect camera video. I feel very blessed to have a nice camera, but I didn't start off with it. You don't have to start off there. You, you grow into the things and then you want to learn how to use them well. I want to go back to this point because I think it's super important here. Relevance is key. Your video has to feel and be relevant to your audience. If it's not, all the other things don't matter. You can have the high-end film quality. You can be making a motion picture that is beautiful and it's going to teach people to know everything they need to know. It doesn't matter if it doesn't feel relevant. If they don't start watching it because it doesn't seem to be relevant to them or if they start watching and it's not relevant, they will stop. 
and all this, make it good enough. Just make it good enough. And what's good enough that you're going to have to decide for your organization, for you. You know, I look at a lot of videos I've done over the last six months and a lot of them are just good enough. They're just good enough. You know, we've grown our quality. We've taken time to grow because we felt like it was important to do that as a company that makes a video tool. However, if your smartphone's all you got, learn how to use a little bit. Get it on camera here. You learn how to use it a little bit and go from there. Your video doesn't have to be Hollywood quality. It doesn't have to be perfect. Put perfect aside. There is no perfect video. There is no perfect thing that you're going to create, but it just has to be good enough and you can decide. You know, there's lots of levels there, lots of layers, and you're good enough may not be some other company is good enough. So just keep that in mind. And again, focus on audio microphone. If you're going to use music, bring it down and then your visuals. Don't just settle for like, if you're going to use, you know, standard like images and stock photos, get us something a little bit more engaging, a little bit more interesting. Hopefully you found the ones I'm using to hopefully do that for you a little bit. As we come towards the end here, I think we're, we're just about there. Um, connect with your audience, look them in the eye. If you're using camera video, talk to their needs, make it for them. You're not making video for you. You're making video for them to train them, to teach them, to inspire them, to inform them. Shoot. Some of you are probably making videos to entertain them, but whatever your purpose is, you want to connect with them. Think about that persona. Think about your Jenna. Who are you talking to? Why are you making that video for them? And what do you know that they need? And as you do that, as you internalize that, you'll be much better off and much in a much better position to make a video that's going to be effective because that's what it's really about. You're trying to make a video that's going to help them. You're trying to make a video that is going to reach to them and help them to accomplish the thing that they need to accomplish. I'm, I'm speaking mostly about instructional video, but even in informational videos, right? So you're, you know, that, that also knowing that audience connecting with the audience is going to allow you to get rid of stuff that you don't need. It's going to allow you to cut it out and say like, nope, that's not for this audience or they don't need that or they need that, but it's not until later they need that. They understand this. So I, I think this is important. It's harder. To, it's hard to do that. I, I, I want to be clear that I don't think there's a, um, a magic bullet here that's going to say like, yep, just do X, Y, and Z do that. I think really, uh, when it comes down to it. This is hard. It's not easy, but I think we can get good at it and it takes practice. So keep practicing. So back to Jenna's problem. Hopefully through this, as we've looked at her problem, you can start to see some of the things that if you were making a video for Jenna, what would you do? You could focus on your title, your description, your thumbnail, your how long, you know, packing in just the right amount of information, thinking about how she's going to react to that content. Um, you know, I, and I know there's a lot of variability, you know, if you don't, you're not working with Jenna, you're working with Helga and Helga is a very different demographic. You're going to have to consider those things. And maybe you're working very broad, like our, our TechSmith audience, we've got people from all across, across the globe, all sorts of age ranges, categories, likes, dislikes, preferences, things they don't like. Uh, it makes it tough. It makes it tough, but try to, try to really hone in on those key things. And, and I think everything will be good. Uh, I'll put this up here again, just if anyone wants to pull up your phone, scan the QR code, I can actually, let me go back to make it a little bit bigger. Whatever you're doing, whether you're making visuals or video, you're training, teaching, doing the things that you do, we hope that you're taking time to level up every day. Thanks, everybody.